We are live in Las Vegas, the last day, day three of the Townie Meeting uh, 2016. This is our 14th annual Townie Meeting, is it? And I am here with um, my idol, my role model. Uh, I got to tell you a story about John Kankin. When I started Dental Town in uh, 98, um, not even 1% of the dentists had internet connection. I would go lecture in a room and I'd say, how many of you guys got internet? And there'd be 100 dentists in the room. One guy would raise his hand. I'd say, what is your email address? And he wouldn't even know. And I'd say, well, why did you get the internet? And he said, well, my, um, the, the kid's teacher said we needed to get it for uh, homework assignments to do term papers on planet Mars or whatever. And um, so 94 to 2004, Dental Town couldn't really grow very well because we were waiting for a dentist to get on the internet. But when they started getting on the internet, it seems like everywhere I went, there were the, the, the top 10 most famous speakers in the world, John Kanka was the only one on there and so many times I would hear Dennis talking, they say, well, you know, I heard, uh, you know, these, these idiots arguing or whatever, and I, I heard it's a dumb forum. And then someone would say, dude, John Kink is on that forum. And they just like, really? John Kink is on that forum? So you were the, you were the guy who validated Dental Town for the first day. I, I'd say from 1998 to at least 2005, you were the single validation Dental Town. I'll always be forever grateful for that. I'm happy to be able to help, Howard. And you have, and you're posting, my God, what do you have, 40,000 posts? 44,382, I think it was, as of yesterday. So, so tell these young kids, because, John, the bottom line is only 5% of Americans have ever listened to a podcast. You're probably talking to about 8,000 dentists right now, but the truth is most of them are juniors and seniors. I'd say 20% are juniors and seniors in dental school, and the other 79% are probably within five years out. And for every guy that sends me an email at Howard at dentaltown.com and says, hey, I just want to let you know there's an old guy like me listening to your show, the next 100 will be young kids. So for young kids, tell, tell them you're, I mean, you um, were very historically important in dentistry. I mean, you were the one uh, before um, any of us ever, we heard it first from you that you could uh, ask Edge Denton. Um, your email is, I don't want to give away your email address, uh, but it was wetbonder at something. Um, but um, so t tell them, tell them your, tell the kids your historical um, well, relation was, with bonding. I was coming out of practice. I spent a few years just in private practice solo. What, what year did you get out of school? Uh, 78. Seven, 1978. And where was that? Uh, UConn. 1978, UConn. And after about four years, I just had a hankering to do more professionally. So I started doing, reading the literature and, and taking, you know, started taking part in some of the meetings. And I wanted to have my name on a paper in the literature. So I tried to figure out some mechanism for that to happen. I ended up buying a hardness tester and evaluating hardnesses of composites and published that paper in, I think, 1983 in Quintessence. And I published a series of papers along that line, along, evaluating hardnesses of composite as they were polymer, light polymerized. Back then, lights were much weaker, and composites didn't polymerize as thoroughly. And you had to polymerize a two millimeter layer of composite for 40 seconds. So that gives you an idea of how far things have come since then. But I started going to research meetings, and then I ran into Bertolotti. And I'm, I'm seeing him talk about etching Denton. He's talking about, he had been to Japan and knew uh, Professor Fusiyama. So I saw him talking about it, and, and I, belonging to the current crowd, said, no, you can't do that. And what I determined to do was to go prove he was wrong, and that you couldn't. Fusiyama? <clears throat> that, that they were all wrong. Wrong about what? Etching Denton, that you couldn't do that it. you couldn't do it. But then I started asking myself questions. For instance, the liquid in zinc phosphate cement is phosphoric acid. In fact, it's 85% phosphoric acid. And somehow you could mix that into a little zinc oxide, put that on the tooth and leave it there for 30 years. But putting 37% on for 20 seconds was really, really bad. And so yeah. I, what I did is I read every biocompatibility paper written since 1945. And one day, and I had my two boys who were, who were young at the time, they, uh, they were, they were playing with their G.I. Joes, and I'm read, reading the papers. And all of a sudden, one day in the Yukon Library, it hit me. I had a revelation. I literally had a revelation. And I erupted out with a, a rather 
uh, in, in, rather expl uh, nasty expletive. And I realized in that moment what was wrong. And I knew what was happening, what should have happened, and what had gone wrong with everybody's thinking. And, and then it, I also knew you could at Stanton, it was fine. And I started to do that. Uh, and I actually uh, joined forces with John Gwinnett early on. And he provided me with some invaluable information about you know, interface relationships of composite resins and tooth structure. And we worked together for many, many years. And it, it taught me you know, what was going on. So I had all my ducks lined up. I had my literature, I had my research, everything lined up. And then one day at the Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry in 1989 at Frenchman's Reef, I was doing a lecture and then I said, because I'm a founding member of the Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry, and I said out loud to the audience, I said, I wasn't going to tell you this. And if you ever want a room, and you probably know this, if you ever want a room full of people to stop what they're doing and then get quiet and turn around and look at you, you just say, I wasn't going to tell you this. <clears throat> and I went on to talk about etching dentin. And the place just exploded. I mean, my name was on, it was everywhere. My face was everywhere. This is the guy who's going to destroy dentistry. This is the guy who's going to kill dentistry. This is the guy who's going to kill patients. And then in one of the, uh, one of the tabloids, someone said, I want the endodontic practice next to his office. And that's kind of how, the prof how professionally I was received. And it was nobody ever asked me questions about, you know, how is this really, you know, the right thing or what, what have you done? And no, that just that got hammered. But I, so the summer of '89 was a very difficult year for me professionally because I was getting pounded from all sides, and I just had to kind of. I realized then you just had to wait it out, and then just accept that this was going to happen. It happened with etching dentin, and then soon after that, I discovered wet bonding, and as I was doing research for that, I kept doing samples. And I would get a certain bond strength and then a certain standard deviation. And as I, I thought, okay, I got some high numbers and I got some low numbers. How did I get those high numbers? And so what I did was I tried drying it more and the numbers were actually start to drop and my standard deviation went up. And I did it more and the number dropped further and the standard deviation went higher. And it, it kind of intuitively go, I'm going the wrong way, <laughs> even though that didn't make sense. So what I started to do was not dry it as much. And when I, all of a sudden the numbers started creeping up and I left a little more moist and the numbers jumped up and then it just shook off the water and put the adhesive on and the numbers skyrocketed. And they were numbers, bond strike numbers no one had ever seen before. And the standard deviation was really tight. And then and again, I, and then I presented that at, a research, at the research meeting, the IADR and other meetings. And again, people said, you're full of crap. It's not gonna work. You can't do that, you're wrong. And I had another one of those things I had to sit out and wait. But I take pleasure in knowing that dentistry changed courses twice because of things that I discovered. And I, I, I am grateful for that. It didn't make me personally wealthy, but, but it, you know. And, and uh, so say, uh, repeat the, the two things. Was the validation of dentin etching and the explanation for why people thought everything was, that you couldn't do it. And I explained why you could. And why, what the factors, for, well, let me give you an example. They would etch teeth, they put acid on uh, animal teeth, and then they put a control material in. And two weeks later, there would be a burn in the pulp, two weeks. And I'm thinking, why two weeks? And then I saw an article by Gunnar Bergenholz in 1978, who had taken lyophilized bacteria put it on a smear layer and got abscesses in the pulp within 30 hours. So I realized that the pulp could react very, very quickly. So why would something take two weeks? Why would phosphoric acid take two weeks to cause a reaction? And then I started looking at the control material. And I saw the control material, when you put the control material into cell cultures, different cell cultures, all of the cells in the culture die. And that control material was zinc oxide, zinc oxide eugenol. That control material was what people had always called bland and non-irritating and kind to the te teeth. It is anything but. So what was happening back then is they would etch the dentin, tubules would be, op be opened up, they'd put this noxious material in there, and over two weeks it would diffuse into the pulp and cause a chemical burn. And that's why. And they attributed that to the acid, but it was always the control material. And that's kind of how I solved it. 
at that point. But it took reading, like I said, it took reading all of the literature to understand that. So, John, a lot of these uh, kids are confused because, I mean, there's so many generations of Bonnie. I mean, what generation are we on now? Eight? Yeah, thereabouts. Yeah. So, I mean, so can you can you explain what was generation one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and and so you'll have a little bit of different uh, opinion on this, but the first dental adhesive restorative was Severton. Severton. Severton, and that appeared in 1948. Oh, okay, I was going to say, how did I miss that one? Yeah. But I, uh, well, I wasn't born. I wasn't born that. then. Yeah, okay. Be a reason for that. <laughs> Severton. So it, Are you kidding me? And who made that? Oh golly, who made that? that I think it was Detre, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Who? Detre. I never even heard of that yeah, one. That's another one. It said capital D, small e, capital T, R E Y. Are they still around? No, they're not. Okay. No. okay. I think they got taken up. I think by Densply, if I'm not mistaken. And so that was 1948. It appears in the literature in 1952 in the British Dental Journal. Kramer and McLean wrote a paper about it. And what was really interesting about that paper was that Kramer and McLean described what they call an aniline dye, what they call a blue staining layer. And that stayed that blue staining layer, that same layer, 29 years later, was finally called a smear, uh, was called a, a hybrid layer by Nobuo Nakabayashi. And so for, but they were actually the first ones to see a hybrid layer. That was fascinating. So that was really the first one. Then came about 1977, Curare put out Nubond. So they had Nubond, which is a phosphate ester-based material. In 1981, 3M presented Scotch Bond, the original Scotch Bond, which was also a phosphate ester. These materials are the second generation. You would etch the enamel only, as if anybody could do that. Okay, so then what was generation one? Generation one was Severton. Severton, and what was? Uh, generation two was, uh, was New Bond and Scotch Bond. New Bond and Scotch Bond, okay. And that one, you would, you would treat the enamel with phosphoric acid, and then you would apply, mix these two materials, mix them up, put them on a dent, and, and then and go. These initially were, were self-curing materials. And you New Bond was Curay, K-U-R-A-Y? yeah. K-U-R-R-A-Y? K-U-R-A-R-A-R-Y. A-R-A. Okay, K U R A R A R Y A R Y Curare. Okay, and you would, these were just self-curing materials. You'd mix them two parts, mix them and put, put them on the dent and the enamel that you etched, and then just you had to kind of wait for it to set. But they were going to set by the side. They're meager, but at least it was a start. The third generation materials were materials in which you would etch the enamel, and then you had a primer that you st placed on a dentin. You would place, you'd take, uh, you acid etch the enamel and then place a primer. Primer on the dentin and then you had a bonding resin. So now you have three parts. There are three parts to the story. There's the phosphoric acid etching of enamel, primer on the dentin and then a bonding resin on top of that. Those were okay, but the dirty secret here, this is about the time now when people are worrying about etching dentin, getting acid on dentin, because that's a no-no. But as you sit there and you watch, these materials that had these primers, the secret was these primers were becoming more and more acidic. Because to make anything stick to a tooth, you have to acid treat the tooth one way or the other. You have to acidify the surface in order for these resins to stick. So they were putting other materials that were acidic, but not as long as it, it seemed it seemed that as long as it wasn't phosphoric acid, then it was okay to put on dentin. You know, as long as it could be it could be nitric acid, it could be sulfuric acid, but as long as it wasn't phosphoric acid, then, then we're okay. And that, that's kind of what was going on. That was the third generation. The fourth generation is the generation I created, because then it became total etch. From, once we broke through that barrier, we could create materials. We just put phosphoric acid on dentin and enamel without, I mean, for the, it's hard. I mean, I don't know who thinks they can really put phosphoric acid on enamel only. I mean, I think that's a stupid thing. Be honest with you. I mean, you know, it's like, how can you do this? This stuff is slopping, especially in the bottom of boxes, and you have thin little layers of, of enamel. How are you going to get this absurd? So now we were free to put phosphoric acid on dentin and enamel, and then there were primers. Primers could be in one bottle, or primers could be in like an A and B type primer. And then so you had primers to put on enamel and dentin, and then a bonding resin. But the difference between the third and fourth was total etch. So that's where you were total etch. And then it so was. Does your, your, does your license plate on your Porsche say Total Edge? Uh, it should say that, but it doesn't say that. It says Dr. John. Dr. John? Yeah, oh, Dr. why didn't you go with Total Edge? Uh, or Wet I, Bonder? I like Dr. John. I had Dr. John license plate since 1976. And it is a Porsche, isn't it? Yeah, uh, 911, yeah. Yeah. 
and and I and then then we this is right about the time when wet bonding was discovered. And, you know, and, and in fact, well, let me step back just a sec. When I took, I had this concept for a fourth generation system, which was phosphoric acid. I took 10 year A and B, and I had Scotch Bond 2 resin for light cure, and I had dual cure Scotch Bond for bonding on crowns. And I kind of created the concept of bonding on crowns. And, and I wrote the first paper, the first article on this, and it was in John, Ron Jordan's book. It, it is his, one of his, his aesthetics books. I have a chapter on there on how to bond on crowns, and it's 1989. And we went from there, right about this time, we started talking about wet bonding. That's where wet bonding came in at fourth generation. And I started, I took this concept that I had, uh, you know, again, it's phosphoric acid, 10 year A and B, and uh, Scotch Bond. And I went to 3M with it, and they didn't want anything to do with it because you're putting acid on dent and patient's going to die, and you're going to go to hell. And then I took it to Kerr, and they said, patient's going to die, you're going to go to hell. They didn't want anything to do with it. The only company that would listen to that was Visco. And, they, and again, they hedged bets. But this system that I created is the system that p became all bond. So with uh, Byung Sung out of Korea. Byung Sung, yeah. Byung Sung. Was he, he was born in Seoul and then he moved to Chicago. He was born outside. He's born outside of Seoul in a small town. But uh, then he moved. They uh, immigrated to the states, and he was working for another company. And then he decided to form his own. What's company. the name of that city outside of Chicago? Shabana or. No, uh, Schaumburg is where the Schaumburg, company, that's where the company is. And yeah. were, were you guys um, collaborators on Albon? I mean, or did or you, you, you I took mean, it to we, him? I, the concept of the uh, acid etch, A and B, and like your and resin is that, that came right out of my. That was what I had, and then he cre we had a couple other monomers to work with. It was still NTGMA in primer A, and he had a he had his own monomer. In, pri in part B, which was called BPDM, or biphenyl dimethacrylate. So he was a chemical engineer? He was a chemist, yeah. A he, chemist. Was, he was a chem organic chemist. So he had a background in that as well. So I took, you know, he, this is, this, first he offered a partial etch of dent and then finally went full blown into full total etch. And, but that's what, that's what, that's where Albon came from. And Albon was a game changer. Oh it? boy, it was a game changer. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the funny thing, I have, I don't have really tons of regrets in my life, but I should have, I should have asked for a piece of the action and I didn't. Here I'm thinking at this time, and this is w one piece of advice I do have for people. At this time I was thinking history, I'm gonna make history, and I did. I did, I changed dentistry two or three times. I changed it completely, that's great. But that doesn't put your kids through college. So what I should have been, I'm thinking history, I'm gonna be in history, I'm gonna be in history, yes. I should have been thinking tuition, tuition, tuition and you know and, and my so my advice is if you have a choice between rich and famous take rich because <laughs> you can buy famous <laughs> um and your your two boys um that you put through school are lawyers and They're you're lawyers. really you're really a dental lawyer i well, mean you 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 read that literature i mean mo mo most people just look at the the summary box and say what do i need to know what how, how do i do it but you, you, you always read that literature like yeah, an like, investigator. Yeah, like a um, I mean you, you remind me of like some um, Baptist minister quoting the Old Testament. I mean you just know all the quotes. You know what I mean? You yeah, just, I, you I, just I, know yeah. all the research. Yeah, I appreciate that. And you can quote that off the top of your head. Oh yeah, yeah. That that's I have a capacity for remembering things like that. And okay, so now we're back. We're a fourth generation. The fifth generation now it begins the pursuit of expediency, and mediocrity. So we instead of and what do you mean by expediency well, mediocrity? We're going to try to shorten the number of steps. So we're going to take the steps down from from three parts. We're going to have now phosphoric acid, and now we take the primer and the bonding resin and combine them into one bottle, and that's the fifth generation. You see things like one step, like prime and bond, those this kind of thing. This is your fifth generation material. The sixth generation material is further effort at expediency. Fifth generation, sixth generation materials don't have any phosphoric acid around them and in them. They depend on acidic monomers to attach to teeth. But for the most part, though, they do not etch enamel as well as phosphoric acid or as well as a lot of other things. So you're giving up something when you're using a sixth generation material. Those you would have, it, they're either two parts. Either you put part one and part two, or you mix the two together and put it on. I mean, that, so sixth generation were two two parts, but no phosphoric acid, no rinsing. 
Then we jump to the seventh generation, which is now, again, the, the great leap into mediocrity. We try to do everything in one bottle. So all you have is one bottle. And again, you're depending on the acidic and nature. What are those brands? Uh, you have things like Scott, uh, Albon Universal's, uh, 3M's ad per adhesive uh, universal number of those. We have one superb, it's like that. Uh, in my opinion, you should never use those without somehow conditioning the enamel first because they just don't etch in it. They, they'll stick pretty decently to dentin because dentin's easier to, 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 to work with. But it, the key in adhesive dentistry in long-term survival of restorations is making sure you've got an adequate preparation and etching of enamel. And I, my advice is absolutely to make sure somehow you condition the enamel. So, what, so, um, so we're at eight now. And, and uh, well, I would argue that what I created, the, the newest material surpass that we have, uh, I would argue that was, it's a newer generation, but it's kind of a combination of two generations. It's a little bit of the fourth and a little bit of the, of the sixth. There's three bottles, but there's no rinsing. And the nice part about surpass is it emulates a fourth generation material, but there's no rinsing, there's no, to how much, how wet is it, how dry is it, everything is either all wet or all dry. So, so, so now, what, now just yeah. let me make the point that the fourth generation has been called the gold standard. And today, it's, it's, that's as good as you can do, other, other than surpass. That's a, realistically as good as you can do. Nothing is better than, uh, again, I would argue surpass is better, but pretty much almost nothing is better than the fourth generation of materials. But people are seeking to do things faster and faster without, again, willing sometimes to give up performance for that. Now, what I try to do is create something like a fourth generation material that's just much easier to use. So you didn't have to rinse anything. You didn't have to worry about how dry it was, how wet it was. So I would argue that was a, a successor generation. Okay, so where along this journey you did start your own bonding company? With well, actually, I didn't. I didn't. I joined forces with a couple of my good friends, uh, Scott Lamorand and Chris Colton, who formed their own company. They had left. They used to work for Bisco. They left Bisco several years well, I think it was probably 20 years ago now. They left Bisco and formed their own company. And what, what are their names? Scott Lamorand. Scott Lamorand. How do you spell Lamorand? R-A-N-D. R-A-N-D. And Chris Colton. Chris? K-U-L-T-O-N. K-U-L-T-O-N. So they had that company. Apex? Apex Dental Materials. They had formed it. And what did and the word of the from apex? Just why why the apex of the root? Why, why did they like that name? Well, they like the apex because of the height, the height, highest point in dentistry. Oh, the highest point. In, I was thinking the apex. Okay, yeah. I was thinking endo. Okay, the apex, <laughs> the highest point in dentistry. Okay, now we're trying to avoid endo. <laughs> okay, apex dental. <laughs> so they started apex twenty years ago, and you were part of that team, or no. just a consultant? I was or? still a consultant for Bisco, mm -hmm. but we had, shall we say, a difference of opinion about things. Uh, about 2001, where I, uh, let's just say that things, I, I, we, things didn't go the way I was, wanted them to go. And I decided Product wise, to, financial wise? Um, I discovered, you know, pulse activation. I created pulse activation in 1996. I, I published a paper on this. And Visco created, you know, not just a small, but, but they created a light called the VIP, Variable Intensity Polymerizer is what it called. And they had a booklet with it about pulse activation. There were seven references in there. I wasn't even in there. I, I would have never even got credit for, you know, and I, I, I'm the guy who created the concept. And I thought that was pretty, pretty unfair. And I was ready to create some, another system and yet, and again, I was, what happened was, as I saw it, is that it, it would, he got all the money, he got all the money, and I was, I was just hoping for credit. But then they started, you know, I saw the credit being taken away, too. So I, was, I became... And who were they giving the credit to? Well, him, the president of the company, of Bisco. Beyond saw. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's kind of how it went. And so I kind of got, I reached a breaking point with that, and I wanted to do something, and then I, because I had a concept to create another, another bonding system. And I, I departed, and then I joined forces with... You know, I heard Scott was around, and I called. You know, I called Scott, and I said, "You want to work with me on something?" And he, and I had always liked Scott. We got along very, very well, and he said, "Sure." And so from that point, right about 2001, that is when I we got together, and 2001, 2002, and we started creating things. We created first simplicity, 
And then a few years later, we created Surpass. Okay, so what year did Simplicity come out? Uh, 2002. 2002? And what do you, um, 2002 was Simplicity? Yep. And uh, Surpass was what? 2006. 2006? So which one of those do you like better? I'll Surpass. Surpass? I'll Surpass is killer. Surpass is Did Surpass killer. surpass Simplicity? Yes, it did. <laughs> yes, it did. And then, you know, yesterday, and I had um, a, a, a friend of mine, one of my, in my private messages in Dentaltown, because I get a lot of those in Dentaltown, you, you know, kids, you know, especially younger ones, looking, looking for advice, and, you know, they tell me the guy I work for won't let me buy the right materials, and I'm supposed to use this. Can you ha tell me the best way to use this? And I, and I do try to help them out. But I, he, he said that there was an, somebody sent me a quote from a, an, an, a Bisco ad that says, you know, that all Bantu is still unsurpassed. And I thought that was pretty funny because then uh, that's exactly why it was written like that. Right. So, 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 so you're not an owner of Apex then? If you look in the corporate minutes, I'm not. But yeah. the, our understand, we have an understanding that basically, you know, it's a three-way ownership. Yeah. Real, I mean, but if I strictly, by the letter of the law, I'm not. Yeah. But, but I, I am from the standpoint. Could your two lawyer sons defend you if something oh, went wrong? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I they own the, but I own the patents. So that's, oh, you own the patents? Yeah. Own the patents. Okay, so then... Um, um, so let's um, explain to these people. I mean, I mean um, dentistry is kind of weird in the fact that when you go to a course, they're always showing full mouth rehabs, yet 96 out of 100 crowns sent to a lab or one unit. And the bottom line is what, we, what I do every single week the most is an MOD composite on a, on a molar. Right. So um, anybody can do an occlusal, but an MOD is tough. Um, especially um, you don't want post office sensitivity, you don't want to like contact, you don't want to pack in food. Well, you just detailed how you would do an MOD composite on a first molar. Well, all right, we're going to, where are we, I mean, where we, do we premise that we remove all of the decay properly? Well, I mean, would you numb it up with septicane, articane? Oh, like, I, like, my, my carbocane is my go-to. Okay, why, why is that? I just like carbocane. It's a fairly good anesthetic, and it's a fairly short-term anesthetic, and then you can use it on anybody. You know, you don't have to worry about uh, systemic conditions at all. And I've just been very. Really? I've always enjoyed that for. How long you been? How, how long has that been your go-to? Uh, Thirty years. And why, why did you give, um, Why did you leave lidocaine, and why why did you not join the septicane revolution? I just it just didn't do anything for me you know I just didn't I didn't see it as a necessity for it is carbogene supposed to be what just a half hour oh I you get about an hour hour and a half out of that you get an hour an hour and a half yeah but but it's not it's not gonna be as durable as lidocaine with epinephrine would be plus you know like I said you avoid the systemic issues so you're not gonna anybody with a tachycardia or a, a, atrial fibrillation you're not running a follow of that at all so okay it's been my it's so been you my numb up with carb carbocaine yeah, yep and uh, I remember back in the day, uh, on Dental Town's early days, 98, another thing I give you a lot of credit for that you didn't mention is uh, no one used a rubber dam yeah. back then. I mean, yeah. the joke was, do you practice under a rubber dam? Yeah, I, I mounted one on the wall so that I'm always practicing under a rubber dam. Yeah. Um, what, what, what do you think about isolation? Rubber oh, dam? Isolation, do you like isolate? Isolation is absolutely critical. Isolate is a marvelous way. To, to gain isolation as well. I mean, we now you have a number of opportunities to get isolation, but a rubber dam is is absolutely a, one a great way to do it, and is a necessity. Can can I can I um, not to detour off on a tangent, but one one of the reasons I don't um, I get upset about the way dentists talk about amalgam in the United States is um, I'll not, okay I've I've seen this in in three different countries, um, in Africa and Asia. Uh, I'm, I, Ryan, when we go to foreign countries, when we're traveling around, when we see a dental office, we hit the brakes, we jump out of the car, we knock on their door. And I watched this dentist in Africa, and um, the person sitting in a chair like this, um, he's all excited, he numbs it up, and he's showing me, he's so excited, and um, he, uh, there's a cavity, and it's on a canine buckle, and he's drilling it, drilling it, drilling it, gets a pulp exposure, I don't think he's aware of it. I know he's on. Um, she keeps setting up spitting uh, water, spitting in a five gallon bucket. And then he gets out this nice bonding kit, which I noticed he paid about um, one tenth of what I paid for it uh, in Africa. And he puts on the etch, and then she doesn't like the taste, so uh, she swishes, spits <laughs> it out. And then he paints on, you know, the resin. She doesn't like that taste. She rinses, spits out. Then he cures it. <laughs> Then he puts on the composite, then he light cures it, then he spends like 20 minutes polishing it for a whole beauty. 
And when it was all over, I thought to myself, there's no isolation in, uh, so there's 2 million dentists and um, I think about 500,000 practice like US, Canada, Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand. Um, then there's a million in the middle, but there's 500,000, John, that I don't, they don't have the mechanics for isolation. And then anything they read is everybody's bad mouth and amalgam. But I, I, so I want to point, ask you this, if you can't get isolation, would amalgam be a better material? Oh, it sure would. If you if you really can't. But they but then, uh, then would, people think if you if you do an amalgam, you're a communist, Nazi, yeah, I know, I, Stalin, I, Idi Amin. I, I gave up I gave up amalgams thirty years ago. But it wasn't because of anything wrong with it. It was just a decision I made. But I do think that it's it's that would be a great place for amalgam. Because it will survive in in you know un, unfortunate or undesirable circumstances. So if you can't get isolation and you can't get moisture control, amalgam's a better restoration. I would, I would argue that that's a good, a good, really good choice or, or something like a, a high density glass ionomer. Okay, what would you say to these dentists who I, I hear them, you see them post that, that mercury amalgam is toxic, it's probably causing autism, you know, I mean, it no. probably caused my hair loss. It actually did cause my hair loss, because seriously, your literature, I had all my hair I went to Creighton uh, freshman year. I went to dental school, got my first eight occlusal amalgams. All my pit and fissures were staying. They did occlusal amalgams. And then that year, all my hair fell out. So can we say for a fact that my eight mercury fillings caused all my hair loss? No, I think it might have been going to Creighton. <laughs> <laughs> it was just going to Creighton. So what, what, so what do you say? To, uh, you, you hear the mercury haters. Yeah, I, I think that's nonsense. It's just nonsense. There, isn't, there, there really isn't any evidence. That I, I Actually, I had one patient in my life. I remember one patient who had contact sensitivity to amalgam. I actually saw that. And every time, every place, each place he had class five buckle, you know, buckle amalgams where the amalgam would touch his, he'd have, a, he'd have a rash. He'd have an eruption in that spot in his or, or buccal mucosa. And I took him out and it went away. I mean, it was just, it was the only thing I'd ever seen like it. I've not seen anything like it since. But, but I, you know, and I still would, but that can so what? So what did you think of that whole Hal Huggins revolution oh, that we I went had, through? I put no, I give it no credibility at all. Because yeah, they're, they're, they're charging people that live in trailer parks $30,000 to remove all their mercury with all this evacuation and they're wearing a NASA suit on the moon. And what, what do you think of all that? I think it's absurd. Frankly. Cause you're a literature freak. Yeah. I think it's absurd. So you're not seeing anything in the no. literature that would warrant. No. no. Some poor lady in a trailer paying thirty thousand dollars to have all of her mercury toxic things removed. You're going to know how many amalgams there are probably in people's teeth in the, in the United States, right? You have an idea? <laughs> what billions? Mm -hmm. You know, and if it was going to show up, it would show up. If these patterns were real, they would show up. You'd know it. You would know it. You know, it's not. It's just not there. It's not there. It doesn't make sense. So I give it no credibility at all. Okay, so. Um, what about uh, just staying on mercury a little bit? Just I was gonna so talk. Some some people say that drilling out old amalgams to place. Some, some dentists say I don't place amalgams, but I'm drilling it out. I'm smelling mercury vapor all day. Is that is that harming me, my assistant, my staff? It is true that if you cut an amalgam dry, you're going to generate more mercury vapor than if you cut it wet. So if an amalgam is being cut, it should be cut wet, not dry. And the other, and then you should have a high volume suction near near it also. But I, I know of absolutely no examples in the literature of anybody suffering for And then wouldn't a sample removal. size of 150, uh, there's 125,000 dentists that work full time. There's 30,000 specialists. There's yes. actually 211,000 people in America who are alive that have a dental degree. Yep. You can't everyone who has right. retired and died. Wouldn't that be a big enough sample to show? Wouldn't you see it in the, in the providers? Would you, you? Yeah, you sure would. You absolutely would. Because you? they're the ones who are totally exposed to it all the time. All the time, placing it, removing it, but there again, there's no pattern in that. It just doesn't exist. And these guys all have money to access to healthcare. I mean, they're, they're in the system. Yeah. So that's no. just no. So there's no research. For that. No. Okay, so you would use carbocane. Now, that surprised me. You yeah. said that you'd use a rubber dam or yep. an isolate. What, yep. what do you use? What percent? I'm, it's it's both. It depends on how I'm approaching this. I if I can get it, isolate is great, but you can't get it for everybody. Not everybody will accept it, and that's okay. And then you go for it, and then you use a rubber dam. And so we'll just kind of get that in place and then start removing whatever we need to remove out of the tooth. Uh, if it's an MOD, and then uh, now I'm going to place, I'm going I'm to secure my matrices. I'm going to use a V3 ring from Triodent. Uh, That's out of Australia? Yeah. It, it or is New out Zealand? Of, out, of, out of New Zealand. New Zealand. I actually, I actually 
met Simon McDonald, I think it was 2004, 2005, when he had the original Naitai uh, prototype. I saw it, the original prototype, and I, and I was, I, I said. Wait, were you in Auckland, New Zealand at the time, or? I was in, um, yeah, I was in Auckland, yeah. And that's where he is? Yeah, and that's where I, that's where I ran it, because he came up to me, and he said, what do you think of this? And I, I looked at it, and, and I, didn't he sell that company? I think he did. I think the he Densply? sold it Densply, yeah. yeah. And I, but when I saw that prototype, I saw, I knew immediately this was going to work. I said, this, this, I'm going to use this one. I never liked any of the other rings. They didn't really didn't do much, but this was going to work. And he had another buddy with him, uh, Marshall White. Yes. He, 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 you're his app, you're his God because Marshall loves the literature and I can't talk to Marshall for five minutes without your name coming up three times. Oh, I appreciate that. But, and Marshall's a great guy. He's a, he's a really good guy. Uh, so I would use these, I would use the V3 rings. They're, they're tab matrices. Uh, and, and attach and fix the rings. And, and after I get the rings in, I'm going to use the wedges. And I do like their wedges. They're what we you originally call wave wedges. So we'll put okay, them stop, in. Okay, stop there because there's yeah. low cost wooden wedges that some people say when they get wet they shrink. And then there's well, when they get wet they expand. They don't. Shrink. Oh, they they when they get they get weaker. But they, when they absorb water, they they swell. Well, wouldn't that be a good thing? Well, it, but it gets softer. So it expands, but then it gets soft. Yeah, it, it's like in, you know, it's like a piece of wood lying in in a, in a river for a long time. So you like wood or plastic? I like the plastic ones. And why? Because they'll stay where you put them, and the shape is is preferable to the wooden ones. Okay. So I either I use the either the flexi wedges, or the or the wave wedges. But those are my two choices, and I like them. Flexi or wave? Yeah, depending. And who on, makes flexi and wave? Uh, Common Sense Dental does, I believe. Common Sense Dental yeah. makes them both. Yeah. Okay. Or makes the flexi. The wave wedges come from Triodent. Okay. So they, this is all inserted. And once I've got my cavity preparation complete and I have the matrix, and I have it all set to go, then I'm going to pick up my Clean and Boost. From, this is a product we make. It's in, it's in um, acid-based. It has acids and alcohols in it. And in, you use it to clean the cavity preparation. Just clean it up. What's it called? Clean and Boost. Clean and Boost. Yeah. Okay. And Clean and Boost leaves a pristine to surface. So you have, you have something in there that will clean the organics, something that will clean the inorganics and remove all of the junk that's in the cavity prep. So the, I put that on there for about 10 seconds and rinse it out and then I would dry the tooth. I would, uh, the way I'm doing it, I dry the tooth severely. And then we apply Surpass. Surpass 1 is prime, it's, it's an acid, it's a mixture of acids but it's mostly water. So it's going to rehydrate the tooth and etch the tooth at the same time. So we put the Surpass 1 on. It stays on for 10, 12 seconds. Three coats of Surpass 2 were applied directly onto that. Surpass 1 is not dried. Okay, are you, are you putting it in with the, the dropper or are you no, no, scrubbing no. it with brushes. a, a brush? They're, they're color-coded brushes. But are you just, like, painting it or are you burnishing it and scrubbing it? No, 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 no. Well, the Surpass 1 is agitated. You kind of agitate the whole thing around it. Just agitate around it, kind of rub it into the tooth a bit. And you leave it wet. And then just three brushfuls are surpassed. They don't have to be rubbed in, just, just apply. Just wick them in, slobber them in, and, and go. And once the three brushfuls are in, you dry it. You dry that severely. And the more dry you make the surpass two, the better bond you're going to have. Which is, see, this is what I love about this stuff. So you dry it as much as you possibly can. Then, then you put surpass three on and thin that out as much as you can. And after that's all, all three parts are in, light activated 10 seconds. The nice part about Surpass is that it's either all wet or all dry. There is nothing in between. The same technique that is used in a class one or class two is used in a class four, used in a class five, used for bonding on crowns. There is one technique, no matter what you're doing. And it can be used under anything, which is what, you know, that was what it was for. It's supposed to be a truly universal material. And it sticks to everything. Self-cure, dual-cure, light-cure, everything sticks to it. So anyway, so I have my cavity prepped. Now I have my adhesive in, I've light activated it. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little flowable in the bottom of that cavity prep, all along the line angles, carrying it out to the cable surface. What brand? Titan. Titan is ours. Okay, so Apex, Apex makes Titan. Yeah, Titan. And is that a dual cure? No, it's or, a light activated. I mean, not a, is that a... What, what type of composite? Flowable composite. Flowable composite? Yeah. It's, what, I like that because you can place flowable composite in the bottom. You can see if there's any problems. You see if there's any defects or if there's any bubbles or voids. You can see it. And that's, you know, that's a critical, that is a very, very critical spot, that bottom of the cavo surface margin in that box. That's where teeth die. That's where restorations die. So you have to be really, really careful about making sure that stays secure and properly constructed. So you get the flowable in there, that slide activated for 10 seconds, and then we incrementally start to add another composite that we, 
exquisite restoration, which is again from Apex. That goes in and we fill that up and then light activate the segments. And then off comes, rubber, off comes the matrix and the rubber dam, we do the adjustments and polish it all out. Now, it, um, by the way, you talk about putting your kids through college. Why isn't that an online CE course, John? Do you, I, I've been begging you since yeah, 19, I know you we have. started online CE in 2004. Now they're, um, now they're on the, uh, the iPhone, they're on the Android, the Samsung, the iPad. But um, here's where you hit on the phone. We put up um, 350 courses. They've been viewed over um, 550,000 times. Um, you'd be selling um, Surpass and Titan and all that for in countries. Well, you could find them on a map, but a lot of <laughs> a lot of our listeners couldn't find some of these countries on a map. Why don't I mean that that's a, that's a big procedure. And the thing that that the um, these young kids are doing with their iPhone is instead of going to a, a, a course like you and I always had to go to a convention, we had to get in a plane, stay in a hotel, go yeah. to a convention. These guys, since it's Apple, uh, they, they get the Apple TV. Have you heard of the Apple TV? I've heard of it, yeah. Yeah, and so it's just a little thing like the size of an iPhone. Yeah. So you, they, they, they pull this up on their iPhone and then they hit um, their big screen or bedroom or front room, and whatever TV's it. on. And, and now they're watching it on their 60 inch big screen in surround sound and they tell me that once you take a course, you know, in your own living room, rocking chair on your own surround sound where you can pause it if you need to go to the bathroom or get a beer or whatever, they, they, just, they just never want to sit in a convention again. And uh, that would just be um, like, see, here's the, uh, um, see, there's one by Restorative Dentistry. The top one is um, Nicholas Conte. Why isn't that? Why isn't that John Kanka no, with forty thousand posts on Dental Town? Well, we're gonna have to do that. I, I wish you would. It'd be it'd be the best damn marketing you ever did for your company. Yeah. And what I like about it is, um, you're uh, I mean, you're, you're you're a legend. I mean, you're the real deal. And the other thing I liked about you the most is, the thing I respected you the most about, not not just your contributions to dentistry, is that why did OJ not take the witness stand? <laughs> Because he killed his wife and her, and her boyfriend. Wife, yeah. they, they can't put him with his hand. And so many of these, uh, you, you, can, you can see who's, I mean, there's 210,000 dentists on Dental Town, but who is conspicuously missing? People out there lecturing, saying shit that they couldn't say in a message board room where guys like you would just start quoting research, say, dude, you're full of shit. They can't take the witness stand. And damn it, you have been on the witness stand since 1998. And no matter what anybody throws at you, you're there, you're laughing, you're answering it, and you won over the whole damn community. Yeah, well, again, I appreciate, I appreciate the kind words. Yeah, you, you have. You won over the whole community. But what I want to do is, what I want to do is, I, I, I want to make this message faster, easier, um, higher quality, lower cost. And that's an online CE course on their iPhone, uh, so when they're, uh, you know, laying in their bed watching TV and there's nothing on, uh, they just, I mean, because if you think about this, if you hold, if you look at your big screen TV and you think it's really big, but put your iPhone in front of it and then move it back to you to where you can't see your big screen TV and you're about right here. Yeah. And that's what they do. They put in their headphones. I mean, I, I, have, I have women dentists tell me this. My husband's laying next to me asleep and I got my iPhone on. It's, lean, it's leaning next to his pillow. I got my headphones in. I'm watching online CE. And yeah. they're getting credit for that. So it's, it's a game changer. Yeah. So we need to make all your information faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost, available to the masses. And that should be a game changer for your company. No, that would be a nice thing. So, so, um, so now you take out the rubber dam. Is polishing cosmetic or is that real? Some people talk about, you know, when you're done with the, com uh, the composite, you should acid etch the margins and, and reapply flowable. Uh, yeah, I like doing that. I like, I like sealing restorations. I typically will go back and seal restorations. At the I time think. it's done? At or? the time it's done. So, yeah. so talk about that. Well, you know, I, I, polishing is a necessity. I mean, you, you, it is a you don't want to have a rough, you don't have rough surfaces. Rough surfaces will attract plaque. So you definitely want to have a smooth surface and you want to have the pits in there you don't want to have stuff accumulating and to stain it to you know it just it's a mess so yes you do want to polish restorations I don't think you have to go crazy putting all kinds of tertiary anatomy and stains and putting decay back in the teeth you know, I think that's I find that folly but but I but you do need to create good occlusion pro, a functional occlusion and if all you do is just Make sure they're out of, you know, properly in occlusion, both in centric and parafunctional movements. Then you've done something well. But I do like to go back. 
I do like to go back and seal them, just in case there's always the you know, potential for little defects along the margins. I like to go back and seal those things, and that's important to me. Do you agree or disagree with this statement? You know, we, you know, we start out in, in college and we learn math, and then applied math. I mean, math is just math. It's one plus one equals two. There's no unless it's philosophy. Common, unless it's Common Core. Unless it's what? A common Core. Then t three plus one could be eleven. <laughs> <laughs> what What is getting that? In, in um, when I look at all the areas of dentistry. There seems to be a lot of math and science and physics and chemistry and biology in a lot of the areas. And so a lot of times the research will win over the majority. But it seems like the one camp occlusion seems to be closer to like religion and philosophy than science and math. Yeah. Um, these young kids out here, one of the most common questions I get is, um, um, I, wanna, I wanna take an occlusion course, but they're all expensive. I mean, Panky's expensive, Dawson's expensive, LVI is expensive, but they need to know, you know, one is, and we're in Vegas right now, one is like LVI or the neuromuscular type camps, and the others are like Dawson, uh, Panky, CR camps, and they just need to know, I, I can't spend 5,000 bucks at each camp. W w does any of those camps make I'm, more sense to you? I'm a Dawson advocate. I am definitely a Dawson Koi Spear type advocate. And what would you call that camp? CR or what would you, what would you call that camp? I mean, if, neuro, if the other camp's called neuromuscular, what would you call the Panky, Spear, oh, Dawson? I don't, want to, I don't want to mischaracterize them, what they think, but, it, you know, the, it, but I, I am adherent to that philosophy. It's not neuromuscular. Not, I'm just not, that, I'm not a fan of that. So you, so, so you would tell the young kid, if, if you've got a limited budget and you're going to take an inclusion camp, um, you, go you, to, do, you, you go to Dawson or you see Dawson, Spear, or Kois, Spear, Kois. Or, you know, something like that. Okay. Yeah, um, definitely. Okay. Um, lights. Let, let's talk about lights. Um, some people um, say that the number one um, issue in the quality composite is they didn't have um, moisture control. You know, they had a contaminated environment. And then the number two quality concern, I'm talking about the masses of all yep. the fillings on. The number two is that their light wasn't strong enough or they didn't use it, but it was the light, it didn't get cured well enough. Yeah. Do, do you agree with that or is um, that? I think that it, it may it may show that may be a an argument that may be a possible uh, outcome. I like I, I like having a proper light, and I the light that I use is a Velo from Ultradent, and I think that's I think that is the finest light on the market. It puts it has a number of different outputs. It can it has a broad a spectrum of a radiance that can uh, light activate any kind of material, and it's robust. So you can you can crank it, you can drop it on the floor, you can do a lot of things. The with Velo, it. yeah, the Velo from Ultradent, yeah, South nice. Jordan, Utah, owned yeah. by um, Dan Fisher, yeah, sir. who speaks, who always mentions you. I don't think yeah. I've ever heard a lecture of uh, Dan Fisher yeah, or your name. He's a terrific guy. He's a, he's a really good friend of mine, and I I have great respect for him. He's just a he's a whirlwind. He's a, he's kind of like you. He's you know hyperactive guy, always doing something, always keeping busy, and trying to do the best he can. I mean, he really he's genuinely a very very kind person, and he's just a great guy. And that would be an LED light. Yeah, it's an LED light. Okay, yeah. some people are saying that these um, these big bulb halogen lights or some of these lasers cure composites better, or a big strong halogen light. I was what would given, you say to that? I was given a laser to use uh, a number of years ago to just investigate how lasers would polymerize resin composites. In fact, uh, it was from another company out in Utah. I won't mention their name. But I- Who's that? Who's I, I'm not gonna mention their name. <laughs> I, I, tried, I tried to, I did light activate composite. Oh, I light activated composite. But it was so strong, so powerful, the contraction force was so powerful that it, ca it caused the composite to rip apart in the process of polymerizing. The composite was bonded to the walls and just actually tore apart. The composite ruptured and the tooth ruptured underneath it. I was just absolutely floored with that. I mean, when I saw that, I, was, I just couldn't believe it. And I said, okay, you know, this is probably not a good idea. So we went through halogen. Halogen lights are too susceptible to, I mean, they were what they were at the time, but they're too susceptible to breaking the tips, the emitter tips. I mean, they're, and they're, they get, it's just not, I don't think it's, I don't think it's where you want to be. I think you want to be in the LED arena. What about those big halogen, what, dense fly? Uh, no, not dense like Denmat. You mean the, Bob uh, the Den you mean the plasma lights, the the, the, sa the sapphire yeah. light, yeah, the yeah, plasma, the plasma. plasma arc lights. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, you don't I, need that I, either. I, no. no, those things put out tremendous amount of heat, and the, you can you can do anything you want to do. Uh, if you wanted a plasma emulation mode, the Velo has that. 
in a tiny little stick rather than a big box. Okay, some people say that, with, but when they go around, one, one of the things that um, I like about the Velo, and, and you're the expert on this, not me, is um, a lot of dentists are using a light that's you know, 10 years old, and it just slowly gets weaker and weaker oh, yeah. and weaker. Yeah. But is it true the Velo, if, the, if, if you turn it over and the, the lights are on, it's strong? It's on. It's it on. Pretty much, LEDs, it, pretty much, they're on. They're it's either on working or, or it's not. On or they're it's not, not on. a slow fade no, away. Not really, no. Yeah. No, they're either on or off, and that's that's the nice part about them. And they're gonna they last a long, long time. So, so I, now I want to go to some uh, political questions. For rich countries like the United States, Canada, Scandinavia, should amalgams be banned? No, 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 because it's still that that would deprive a lower socioeconomic group of the ability to have restorations because it, it's they're fast it's faster to place an amalgam and you can place it at much lower cost than you can a resin composite so i i would see i think that's a terrible that would be a bad thing to do yeah i agree so um I, i've been asking all the questions is there anything else else you want to talk about well i i just you know things that that pop into my mind are uh one of the things that we run into that, that I find is a, a nuisance, no matter how you try to polymerize some teeth, you end up with white lines along the margins. White lines are fractures of the enamel. Sometimes the tooth is just so, it's taken such a pounding, the enamel in an area is just fragile, no matter what you do. Unless you're going to cut it all away, you try to bond to it, and you're going to still cause a little rupture along that interface. And when you break that interface, all over time, that will stain and degrade and you know, become a problem. And one of the things I like to do with that, we have a product called Interface, which is actually a ceramic primer. But what I found was you could use Interface, you can mix it up, and after it's mixed, you could apply it to the margins and just let it sit there and sit there and kind of rub it in for a little while, and it will make the white line go away. You can actually repair it, which is just wonderful. And then you add a little adhesive on top of that and light after like that. And it just is a great way to, to do things. So like, is that is that a is that a cosmetic treatment or that this no is this gonna... is this is a this is a functional repair. So because like I said, a, a white line around a resin composite over time is going to turn into a brown line, and it you know become an access point for bacteria for stain for you know lo loss of the restoration. And this repairs that. So this is something it's it's relatively new, but this is it repairs it, and I, I think this is a, a valuable asset. Well, I see you I see you as a um, I see you as a father figure leader yeah. in our industry. Um, I mean, you um, you you've been in it a long time. You're a founding father of the ACD. You changed course of dentistry and research and bonding. Um, um, so these are a lot of young kids, and and they're um, so. So I want to ask you this. From when you got out of the Yukon in 78. No, you can figure it out. How to today and no, no, but from today in 2016, is, is, is the profession of dentistry a better sovereign profession? Is it, is it getting, is it more sovereign? Is it more commercial? Is it going in the right direction? Is the oh, okay. dental playground yeah. better? Are you going to leave when you retire someday? Will you let the dental playground better than you found it as far as, you know, the, the macro, not what you did micro, but macro is dentistry headed in the right direction? No, the, no. And what, what, what are your thoughts? So I'm bothered by the mega corporations buying up practices because then it becomes, we're not concerned anymore with, patient outcome, but simply getting things done. And then forcing the, the younger dentists into doing things they know they really shouldn't be doing. That, that worries me a great deal. Do you hear that from kids in, oh, yeah. in oh, dental, yeah. corporate dentistry? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you hear it a little or do you hear it a lot? I'm hearing a fair amount of it. I'm getting, again, I get emails, I get private messages. And what, what are some of the things you're hearing? What are some of the things that you hear that bother you? One of the things I read just the other day was that you know, so the owner of a larger practice said to one of the younger kids, why did you mark these as simple extractions when you could have marked them all as surgical extractions, which is an abuse of the system. And, you know, and there was another presentation where there's a picture of an, a tooth with an occlusal composite restoration, and there may be a little crack in it somewhere, and the patient was told it needs a, a crown. And I'm looking good. I'm aghast at this, but this is what, you know, this is kind of where you're seeing pressure from top for performance, and, you know, in a, in a solo environment, you tend to kind of do what's best for the patient, but if you're an employee in a big corporation, then that becomes, it, it's, it, the patient is a commodity now, to, an asset from which to extract money, and not so concerned about the long-term 
you know, health. And you hear hygienists saying that in these, some of these big corporate chains that they feel they have to stick uh, tetracycline chips, perio chips in these pockets, but they go to courses and they're not sold on the idea, but they, they have to. Have you ever heard that? I've heard, I've heard it happening. I don't know of it personally, but I have heard of no, it. Another big game changer um, since I first heard you lecture has been um, CERAC. Um, do, do you think CERAC is, um, what are your thoughts on, on CER, or not CERAC, but CAD CAM? CAD CAM. I, I think CAD CAM can be used really well, but I, I know it's abused. I know it is abused. Again, you have, you buy this monster machine, and this big note that you have to carry, and then there's a software upgrade every year, then there's a hardware upgrade every year, and there's all this stuff you have to do, you have to take courses, and, when you, and then if you're using your office, you have to hire somebody else. I mean, these are giant financial burdens to be adding to somebody, and it means you have to, you have to use it, you have to put it out there. And so what you're seeing is, you know, I, I mean, and again, I, I, go, I go to the boards and I'm seeing, you know, look at these teeth that have amalgams, and, and well, now I replace them with all inlays. I don't personally see any in clinical indication for an inlay that, that is anything other than direct composite. I don't see it. And, and, and I sometimes get in trouble by asking, why did you remove that amalgam? Well, it had decay underneath it. Well, yeah. How did you know it had decay underneath it? Because you took it out. You know, so I mean, you start to see in doing inlays. And there was another case where I just looked at one and they said, well, and this dentist invited a friend to come in and do some, seric, or do some CAD CAM inlays. And, and the guy who was describing it said these cavities were small. And I'm thinking, why are you doing an MOD inlay on a CAD CAM unit for a small cavity? See, this is, this is where, that, that's where I start getting angry. And I actually, I, I read, and I'm not sure which forum it was on, but I read there was a woman dentist, and I, again, I have no idea what her name is now, but I read about one woman dentist who said, oh, some of these pieces are so small, I'm having trouble handling them. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? You're having trouble handling them. You, they're so small, you can't handle them, and you're, you're, you're charging somebody for an indirect restoration for the, this kind of stuff. You know, all I can think is, what are you going to do next? A Pitt and Fisher CAD CAM? You know, I mean, this kind of, that. I never thought of that. I'm going to be the first published person <laughs> to do a buckle pit CAD CAM inlay. <laughs> but that, um, see, I see that. The potential, the pressure, the financial pressure is so enormous that you end up having to, you basically, everything becomes the nail for your hammer. Um, I want to I um, have you weigh in on another huge debate that no dentist will agree on is uh, how long does the average, I don't know what you want to call it, the median, the mu, the mode, the mean, how long does the average amalgam last in America? How long does the average composite last, direct composite in America? Because one is metal, the other one's plastic. One, all the ingredients are kind of bacterial static, mercury, silver, zinc, copper, tin, all the, like, stannous fluoride is tin, amalgam, and, 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 and silver, silver nitrate. In fact, I want to come back to get that on the second question about silver nitrate under um, fillings. Um, and the other um, direct composite is an inert material that has, that doesn't bother bugs at all. I mean, we, we spend our whole life worrying about these gram negative faculty of anaerobic streptococcus mutans coming in and eating all this. So how long would a, a metal antibacterial silver, zinc, copper, mercury amalgam last? How long would inert plastic composite resin last? It's hard to give you a number ex exactly because you're going to say who did it. I mean, that's going to, that's going to come into my mind is who did it. I have resin restorations going back 30 years you know, that, that have survived 30 years. They don't look as good as they used to, but I mean, the materials I have today are way better. Amalgam could last a lifetime. I mean, there's no question about it. It could last a lifetime. But, but, but all those variables went in. I mean, there's 330 million people with various home cares and diets. There's 150,000 dentists, different skill sets. But just for the whole United States of America, what would you, the you have to? Out? The other thing you have to remember is that amalgam has been around for, you know, 200 years. But, um, but composite is new and still is evolving as a, as a technology. So I think th as we develop materials further, that, that difference will narrow. I think we're going to see that narrow. We're going to have better stuff that we work with. So, but I think it, and, well, your, your argument is leading to saying that amalgam is going to la typically last longer. Typically it does right now. But I still see resin composite dentistry in its early adolescence. But I, I'm a dentist, 
and I got four boys, and um, you know what all of our restorations are in our in our mouth? Mm, I, I'm gonna guess. They're all gold. Yeah, they're all gold. I mean, I and, and this whole time we're talking, I have not. I've tried to see, look at your molars, see if I could see a molar. I have not seen a molar, and I've been talking to you for one hour and one minute, and you haven't seen my gold because you know. So I, I, do you still think gold is the gold standard? Is that is that a gold pun is, or is gold that... is marvelous? I mean, gold is marvelous, and it, you know you can't argue with gold at all. If someone said what restoration, what what restoration on a molar lasts the longest, what would you say? Would you say gold, amalgam, composite? I'd say zirconia. You'd say zirconia? Yeah. Wow, I was not expecting I'd you to say, say that. zirconia, because zirconia. I mean, you know, I have zirconia knees. I have, I have I've got zirconia knees. Zirconia, I think, is will be the new gold. And how did you get that? Was that a? I got sandwiched in, a, in between two cars when I was working at a gas station at the age of 19. I was working was ten minutes before I was supposed to go home. I'm standing in front of a Pinto, the one that didn't catch fire, and I'm putting gas and oil in it. And a woman in a Skylark backed up into me, hit me, and put my knees in the radiator of the Pinto. Oh my god! Ten minutes God. before I was supposed to go home. Oh, I didn't. So I didn't break anything. You know, it caught me, and my knees rode up on the bumper, and and I was actually pretty yeah. lucky because it could have hit me. The bumpers are the same size. I don't have any legs. If the bumper was below me, it would have snapped my legs in pieces. So it was slightly higher, and it hit me, and, and like I said, my knees went up and into the radiator, and I and nothing broke because of that. I was able to fold, but I couldn't walk for a month, and and, and if over time, that's it. One one uh, one thing I want to get you. Know, we'll, we'll switch over to the pediatric dentist. Um, silver nitrate seems to come in and out uh, uh, the history. Well, dentistry. silver nitrate right now the the uh, formulation would be silver diamine fluoride, not silver nitrate. Oh, okay, silver diamine fluoride. Yeah, silver diamine. And what's yeah, the brand on that? Um, I think it comes out of uh, Australia. I'm trying to remember the company, but it comes. So, out of so what are, what are your thoughts on silver diamine fluoride? It's effective, but it turns everything black. It still does do, it does do that. Can you put it under a composite? I mean, no, you, oh, no, it, no, no, no. It would mean it, to stain it. It you can only put it underneath a an amalgam or an amalgam or, or if you on teeth you don't if no but someone if if it is if aesthetics are are not going to be an issue, and you just want to preserve teeth. Then you can you put it anywhere. But where 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 are you seeing it used today? That's a good idea. Um, I think in third world countries that you know if you could put this in an arrest decay process even if you didn't get to do much else that that would that's a that's a that's a pretty good thing to do okay now i'm, now I'm gonna have to ask just a, a really uh, controversial question um the some of these dentists um are they, they like carries indicators and they they it keeps saying it keeps saying it keeps saying then they got a, a pulp exposure right um, and then some people talk about affected dentin, affected dentin, mm -hmm. and then others like, well, if you don't have a microscope, how do you, how do you know when you cross from one to the other? Um, so, uh, you, so my I question, can, I can tell you. Oh, oh we'll tell us. Yeah, because uh, caries affected dentin doesn't stain. Caries infected dentin does. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, so if it is infected that's, with streptococcus, if that's infected with streptococcus mutans, then yeah. it'll stain. It'll stain. And what stain do you use? I Did use you the, use thing? I use a uh, Seek from Ultradent. I okay. use, oh yeah, I definitely use it. And what percent of, do you use it on all your restorations? No, I'll use them when I'm getting fearful of, of depth. You know, I want to know in now I know where you're going with this. And yes, the answer is yes, you can. <laughs> can, can you're going to ask your question. Your can, question's going to be can you leave some stuff underneath and and, yes. and the answer is yes, you can. Absolutely. The literature now is replete with study after study of study and then meta-analysis after meta-analysis saying that it does not, if you need, if you want to arrest caries, you just seal it. There's a study by Eva, here we go. How, how much caries? There's a study by Eva Metz Fairhurst and a, and a host of other authors, okay, including Frey Rugerberg, 10-year study published in the American Dental Association in 1998, 753 patients were followed for 10 years, 753. And all they did to take occlusal caries, bevel the enamel in frank cavitation, and just sealed it all in. Just sealed it, just restored it, sealed it, plugged it up without removing anything. And 10 years, there was no progression of lesions in any of those teeth. This is, that's the 800 pound gorilla of studies. 
and you just you can't ignore it. So would you would you be telling these kids that if if the tooth is asymptomatic and and when you went in you That's didn't think you were That's gonna, the key. The okay. key is asymptomatic and no radiographic evidence of anything So you wrong. didn't think you were going to do a root canal when you started. You saw no evidence they weren't it wasn't bothering them. You stop. When you think as you approach when you start getting nervous, when you start getting worried about how deep you are, that's when you stop. Stop. Just don't leave it. Leave it and seal it in because the literature does absolutely indicate that if you seal that in, you arrest the progression of caries. You arrest it. It either dies or stops. Okay, so what would you say to the other guy who says, I'd rather remove all the decay and then do a pulp cap? Uh, no. Carious exposures are precocious. They're, they're unpredictable. Their, their success rate is, is not very high. No, mechanical exposures you can actually you can you can take care of them very nicely, but carious exposures are are unpredictable. So you'd be better with a you'd going be to endo, just, doing if, a root canal, or if you got a carious exposure. If you had a carious, yeah, I would still try it. You still, still try. I would still try it. It's again asymptomatic, no evidence, and no none of the red flags. But but the best thing to do is don't get it, don't get the exposure at any cost. Don't get the exposure, and you tell the patient, look, I'm going to seal this in. It may or may not work. But in, you know, we'll, we'll see. We're going to give it a tooth a, tr a chance to heal. I've never met anybody. I've never seen a single patient in my life who ever said, "No, I want just do the root canal now." And they said, "You know, if we can save it, we can keep it vital. If you can keep it vital for 18 or 20 years, they're going to they'll be very happy with that." I also I, I've heard you speak so many times I couldn't count them. You you also were one of the early pioneers on magnification. Oh yeah. I, I mean, you've been harping that oh, yeah. since oh, yeah. I think I first saw you in 87, was that? Or when did yeah. you start lecturing? 84 is when I started lecturing. Yeah, I so think I saw you way. first in 87, and um, I personally didn't listen to that piece of advice for another five years. I just thought, what? I can see. What, what, do, you, what do you say to a kid who says, oh, Howard, you're fat and 53. Of course you need magnification, but I'm a, I'm a rocking hot 25-year-old. I, I don't need magnification. What I'd would you say, say to that guy? i unequivocally you're nowhere near as good as you can be without magnification. You're not a good dentist without magnification. Flat out. You're just not a good dentist without magnification. And what, what magnification are you using? Three and a half to four and a half. Yeah. You're kind of an average thing. It's three and a half, four and a half, depending and, on. And another thing I'm a big proponent of is, um, you know, dentists get mad because their hygienists left calculus, so their assistant didn't clean off the cement right But they're not, they're, the dentists use magnification, but not oh, their I, assistants. I make, I make everyone I in my make, office, every hygienist, is, if you work at today's dental, you have to wear magnification. Yeah, I totally agree with that, totally as mine do. So, um, and anything, any, any, anything else that you're passionate about? Well, golf. <laughs> golf? So, um... I, uh, a lot of, uh, okay, if you're on Dental Town, you, you, you might not know this. I, th I think most people I talk to you don't know this, but on the Today's Active Topics, we have, we have 51 categories, root canals, fillings, crowns, all that stuff. It's all on Today's Active Topics. If, if you post on a thread, it stays on Today's Active Topics for exactly 24 hours. But if you go to Leisure, there's a forum called Politics, and it says, um, Easily offended, do not enter. Because if you complain about whatever we're saying, okay, it wasn't on today's act topics. You specifically went to leisure. You specifically went to politics. And now you're whining to me and Hogo that someone said something you didn't like. But you have been the king of the political section for a long time. So everybody's out there wondering, are you going to vote for, uh, is it, do you think it's going to come down to Trump and Hillary? And if so, which one of them are you going to vote for? Well, I'm not going to vote for Hillary. Whether I not whether I vote for anybody else is you know remains to be seen. Uh, I I I find this right now very distasteful. I find the whole process very distasteful. I think it's it's a it's a disaster. On one hand, on the other hand, it's it's pretty interesting. It is interesting to watch, as you would watch you know uh, a, the civil if you were watching the civil war from a balloon somewhere. It's saying it's tragic, but but it's it's something you don't really get to see very often. Uh, I. I am interested to see what happens at a convention, whether, they, whether the nomination is seized away, wrestled, wrestled away from Trump, should he have enough, candidate, you know, enough delegates. I think that would be, on the one hand, might be, a, might be the best thing, but it'd be a terrible thing for democracy. You know, that's because that, you you're nullifying all of the, all the people. I think it's funny when people say, do you think, you know, when I'm, um, me and Ryan just lectured in a bunch of countries and people are saying, do you think he could be, do you think he could, Trump could be elected? And I'm like, dude, Mussolini and Hitler were elected in democratically free elections, correct? Yeah, they were. I mean, I don't think. I mean, anybody could be anybody elected. Anybody could be elected. You know, the thing is, 
what is it, you know, everybody's telling him what, what he's going to do, what he's not going to do. It's like, you know, politics is a funny animal. You do need to cooperate. You do need to make friends. You do have to do that. You can't just bully. You can bully your way through business, but you can't bully your way through government. It just doesn't work like that. People just sit on their hands and go, you know, screw yourself. I'm not going to do this. If you, if you could pick your person. Scott Walker. Scott Walker. Scott Walker. If I could pick one guy. And I'm, I'm sorry. I don't even know who that is. Who, the who? governor of Wisconsin. The governor of Wisconsin? Yeah. I'm not even he aware of this is, guy. He is, in my opinion, easily the most capable, most capable, best candidate that's out there. And he's a Republican? Yeah. Scott, what, is, yeah. is, he, is he in the race? He was, and he got ousted okay. pretty early. But I still think he was the best candidate. And why, why, why is Hil Hillary a categorically no? I don't like her. You just I don't like her? I've never liked her. As you well know, <laughs> yeah, I, I find her dishonest. I find her untrustworthy. The reason I went there is because um, when people say to me that the the biggest sport in America is the NFL, they do eleven billion dollars a year. I always say, no, 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 you're not an American. The biggest sport in America is the election every four years. I mean, it's just the whole. I mean, the Super Bowl hype is for a couple of weeks. The election hype is for a flipping year, yeah. and the money spent is. Actually, crazy actually it's not not for a year it's almost non-stop no. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. Is, it is almost non-stop you're talking about it we were talking about this you know it, it was in, in it's a, in the news item for the last three years almost you know the, who, yeah. the next election the, ba the biggest sport in america is absolutely the presidential election yeah. I, I think there's no doubt about it um john um any anything else that you uh anything else you want to talk pretty about pretty good pretty good yeah i just want to tell you profoundly from the bottom of my heart thanks for being the first top 10 speakers in the world, top one tier that validated dental town. I mean, if, if you were the saving grace of dental town for the first, at least five, six, seven years, I mean, I mean, it was just when, when people get on stage and say, Oh, those are a bunch of idiots on there. They don't know what they're talking about. It was always dude, John Kink is on there. And then they'd say, really? And then they'd want to look. And now that thing's got 210,000 members. Um, I really want you to do the online CE course, John, because I'm so glad you did the podcast. I've been, I wanted you to be my first podcast and it's taken me a year to get you on. And, um, because uh, I want to turn you on to the next generation. And I think that online CE, um, it, it'll be watched in every single country on earth the, the first month. Oh, that'd be nice. All right, buddy. Thanks Hard. again. Thank you.